Welcome to the White River, located in the Green Mountains of Vermont. My name is Dr. Brian Jerome, and as you can see, I'm spending this crisp, cool fall afternoon fly fishing. I am participating in a food web, or food chain. During the next few minutes, we're going to take a look at the interaction of many of the plants and animals that live in and along this river. And if I'm lucky, I may even catch a fish. We are going to take a look at food chains, food webs, and the types of organisms, including producers and consumers, make them up in ecosystems. In other words, we are going to take a look at what eats what in the White River ecosystem. First, let's take a plane ride to see what this river looks like in the air. Below is the White River ecosystem. An ecosystem is a place where plants and animals interact with the environment. This is a river ecosystem, or a riparian ecosystem. The White River is actually part of the much bigger Connecticut River riparian ecosystem, which drains into the Atlantic Ocean. The White River is supplied with bountiful amounts of water from ample rain and snow. The climate is moderate, with warm summers and cold winters. The White River is located in mountainous terrain. These factors, along with others, have a great influence on the type and interactions of the plants and animals. And there are a wide variety of plants and animals. Some of the plants include ferns, wildflowers, shrubs such as this colorful sumac, trees like these birch trees and these colorful maples in autumn colors, and conifers, such as these white pines, as well as aquatic plants, such as these cattails, and lichens, such as these growing on this stump. In fact, there are over 200 different species or kinds of plants in the White River ecosystem. There are also many different kinds of animals, including salamanders, many different types of ducks, such as these mergansers, insects, such as this wasp, large vertebrates, such as this bull moose, and small invertebrates, such as these mussels, white-tailed deer, fish, such as this largemouth bass, reptiles, such as this turtle, beavers, capable of making large lodges, like this one. River otters, once nearly extinct in many areas. And turkeys, just to name a few. All these plants and animals interact with each other and the environment in and along the White River ecosystem. I'm paddling over thousands of organisms. Most of them you can't see with the naked eye. In fact, one handle of water contains dozens, if not hundreds, of microscopic organisms called plankton. Plankton are organisms that float in the water. Phytoplankton is one type. It is a mixture of microscopic plants. Phytoplankton is found in ponds, lakes, and is found throughout the world's oceans, as seen in various colors on this satellite image. It is a very important food source and is also responsible for producing oxygen. Phytoplankton, like other green plants, is a producer, meaning that it produces or makes its own food. Producers take simple raw materials and convert them into food. Converting energy from the sun, along with water and a gas called carbon dioxide, plants make a simple sugar called glucose, commonly used for medical treatment. This process of taking carbon dioxide, water, and with sun producing oxygen, water, and sugar is called photosynthesis. Without photosynthesis, none of us would be able to survive. Most animals, including humans, either directly or indirectly utilize the energy that plants bind up in sugar or food they produce. Producers 
are the ultimate source of energy in most ecosystems. Organisms that cannot make their own food, such as these cows, depend on producers for food and energy. In this case, they are eating grass, which is the producer. When animals, like these sheep, eat grass, they are called consumers. Other types of animals, such as this hawk, consume animals. They are also called consumers. You may be wondering what I'm using for bait. I'm using an artificial fly that imitates an organism that lives under these rocks called the caddis fly nymph. This is the young form of flying caddis insect. It eats microscopic plants. It is a special kind of consumer called a herbivore. Herbivores are animals that eat plants. Here in the White River, nymphs of a variety of insects are often eaten by fish, such as trout. Trout eat other animals, thus they are called carnivores. Consumers that eat other animals are called carnivores. In other words, they are meat eaters. Trout are consumers, eating nymphs and other small animals. The nymph is called the prey. Animals that seek out other animals for prey, such as the trout, are called predators. The fishing has slowed down a little bit here on the river, and I may have discovered one of the reasons why. I have some competition here. A heron. One of the top predators along the White River is the great blue heron. It has a long, sharp beak, long legs for wading, a huge wingspan, and a keen ability to capture many types of prey, including rodents, snakes, and fish. A heron is a type of consumer or predator that eats animals. A food chain illustrates the feeding relationships and transfer of energy between organisms in a specific place. Reason is called a food chain because each organism is linked to the other, as in a chain. The feeding relationships that we just discussed form a food chain that looks like this, with phytoplankton being eaten by a nymph, which is also eaten by a trout, which is then eaten by a heron. Organisms in a food chain are either producers or consumers. Phytoplankton, a producer, with the other organisms being consumers. Each level in a food chain is called a trophic level. Trophic comes from the Greek word trophikos, for nourishment or food. These are numbered first, second, third, and fourth trophic level. As one organism eats another in a food chain, matter is transferred, meaning that the matter or mass of an organism is eaten by the next organism. When we eat something, we are taking in matter and energy. We need energy to move and carry out bot functions. The food chain demonstrates the transfer of energy. But food chains rarely exist in nature as isolated single chains by themselves because many animals in an ecosystem, like crows, eat more than just one kind of food. For example, one such animal left this. It's feces, or scat, that came from a black bear. We can learn a lot about animals by looking at their scat. If you look closely, you can see seeds, and we know that this black bear was eating apples. Bears eat both fruits, such as apples, and rodents, such as this squirrel. They are both herbivores and carnivores. Omnivores are animals that eat both plants and animals. Picture that these raspberries were eaten by a small bird, which in turn was eaten by a snake which was eventually eaten by this great blue heron. It might also be possible for the bear to eat the berries or snakes. And suppose that this squirrel could serve as food to a bear or a snake, or it could also eat the berries. As you can see, our simple food chain quickly becomes a tangled web. We call this a food web. A food web is a much more realistic representation of what actually occurs in nature and represents many intermeshed food chains. 
Another very important player in food webs are decomposers. Decomposers consist of fungi, worms, bacteria, molds, and any creature which helps break down dead organisms. They are constantly at work, as is this mold on a piece of bread. When you walk through the forest, you don't see towering piles of dead trees and animals. It is because decomposers break them down. These logs in the White River are decomposing at this very moment. And household scraps and yard trimmings are being broken down in this compost pile. Adding decomposers to our food web, we can see that everything is eventually broken down by decomposers. Decomposers, like these worms, recycle nutrients from dead organisms, allowing living ones to flourish. We can rearrange this food web with producers at the bottom and then consumers further up. Not only are helpful things like nutrients passed from organism to organism, but so is energy. When one organism eats another organism, energy, or food, is transferred. When energy is transferred from one organism to another, a great deal of it is lost, given off in form of heat. In fact, in many cases, nearly 90% of the energy is lost in the form of heat, as is seen along this food chain. This concept of energy loss can also be illustrated in a type of pyramid called an energy pyramid. An energy pyramid compares the energy available at each level of the food chain. Notice with each successive feeding level that the amount of energy decreases greatly so that as one organism eats another, less energy is available at top of the pyramid. By studying food chains and webs, we can also learn about something called biomass. Biomass is the mass or weight of an organism and its parts such as these leaves. For example, this nymph weighs a fraction of a gram. If we were to catch all the nymphs in this stream and other microscopic food sources, their biomass would be greater than the biomass of all the trout. We can view biomass in this biomass pyramid where you can see the total amount of biomass decreases as you go up the pyramid. In most healthy ecosystems, the biomass of the producers or plants is far greater than the biomass of the consumers. While energy flows through ecosystems, matter is recycled. Water, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and other chemicals needed for life are recycled continually. These materials come from waste materials and dead organisms. They are broken down and made useful to living organisms by decomposers. For example, these trees are absorbing the nutrients from once previously living plants and animals. It's a type of natural fertilizer. Contaminants such as pesticides can also be passed along the food chain. They can be harmful to animals and humans. Biomagnification is the term used to describe the process of contaminants being passed along the food chain and becoming concentrated in animals higher up the food chain. The process of biomagnification was brought to the public's attention by Rachel Carson in a book titled Silent Spring, in which she described how the harmful chemical DDT was passed along the food chain and caused the eggshells of eagles and other birds to become thin not allowing young to develop properly. This caused certain bird populations, especially hawks, eagles, and falcons, to plummet. But the eventual banning of DDT and other harmful pesticides has reduced these toxins in the food web and allowed populations of these birds at the top of the food web to rebound. Along the White River, the food chain was drastically altered by early settlers, disrupting the flow of the river over 200 years ago. Large dams built for water power to run mills prevented migrating salmon going from the Atlantic Ocean upstream along the Connecticut River into the White River. Serving as a food source for people, eagles, bears, and many other animals, these salmon all but disappeared from these waters. Unfortunately, I didn't catch this one on my fly run. It's an Atlantic salmon from the Bethel National Fish Hatchery.
history here on the White River. Today, researchers with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the state's alarm in Connecticut River are attempting to reintroduce the salmon by raising them in this hatchery. By helping them reproduce, their chance of survival is greatly increased. The return of the Atlantic salmon to Vermont is just one of the many efforts throughout the world to help food webs return to their once natural state. This diagram summarizes many of the terms and concepts discussed during the past few minutes, showing the feeding relationships along the White River between producers and consumers. Illustrating on the right, the energy is lost further up the food pyramid or web and due to decomposers, matter is recycled. I finally have a trout on the line. I'll reel it in so we can see what it looks like. It's a nice brook trout. I will let him go so he can continue to be a part of the food web in the river. I hope you've enjoyed studying the relationship between plants and animals here along the White River. Next time you get a chance, observe the feeding relationships of the plants and animals in your neighborhood. You'll be amazed what you find. Now we're going to take a few minutes to review some of the things you learned while watching this video. Just fill in the blank with the correct word when you hear this tone. Let's get started. Number one, and is a place where plants and animals interact with the environment. Number two, green plants are also called because they make their own food. Number three, animals that cannot produce their own food are called <coughs> Number four, <coughs> are organisms that eat other animals. Number five, a food chain or food <coughs> illustrates the feeding relationships in a place. Number six, each level in a food chain is called a <coughs> level. Number seven, when we eat something, we are taking in and energy. Number eight, are important organisms that break down dead organisms. Number nine, when one organism eats another organism, a great deal of energy is lost in the form of <coughs> Number 10, the energy pyramid shows that <coughs> energy is available at each step up the pyramid.